This talk is called Describing Grating-Based Phase Contrast X-ray Imaging with the Fokker-Planck Equation from Kay Morgan and David Paganin of Monash University. It was first presented at the X-ray Neutron Phase Imaging with Gratings Conference in Sendai, Japan in 2019. So let's look at first phase contrast X-ray imaging. So conventional X-ray imaging utilises attenuation. So if we imagine this grey jelly bean like structure to be some sample that has a very small x-ray beam that we'll call a beamlet passing through it, we would see that the height in intensity of that beamlet would decrease as it passes through some kind of attenuating sample. If we capture this kind of image we typically see the bones um, very well. But there are other modalities that we can capture. So if we imagine some sample that incurs some kind of phase shift to the wave field that passes through it, we would see that this little beamlet is going to move transversely or, or sideways within the image plane. And if we can capture this kind of information, this phase, we can get an image which is very sensitive to soft tissue structures uh, as we see here, um, where we've got the lungs and the airways are particularly hot, isolated uh, as well as the, uh, the arms. A third modality we can capture is the dark field modality where we look at how this beamlet is kind of blurred out if you like uh, and so this beamlet in this diagram is uh, assuming there's other beamlets on either side and so this particular signal will be seen the most when we have some kind of sub pixel structures within the sample um, that are incoherently scattering the light and so in this image here we see a lot of dark field signal coming from the lungs we also see it uh, from the fur of the mouse that's imaged and also from the fibrous piece of tape that's holding his arm in place. So we can capture these three uh, modalities using a range of setups and I want to consider uh, this in a very general sense for this talk. So this beamlet could be seen uh, through a phase or attenuation grating. We could be directly resolving uh, this beamlet and seeing how it moves and spreads. It could be analysed using a grating interferometer, um, using edge illumination, or this little beamlet could be um, a speckle in speckle-based uh, phase contrast imaging. So in this talk, uh, the aim was to come up with a straightforward mathematical equation that would incorporate all three of these contrast mechanisms, attenuation phase and dark field. And so the way that we propose to do that is via the Fokker-Planck equation. So this talk will look at what is this equation and how can it describe these effects and more particularly how can it be applied to grating based phase contrast imaging. These come directly uh, from two papers uh, that are published in scientific reports in 2019. So if we imagine this small beamlet uh, we can plot the intensity as a function of position here. Uh, and if we have some kind of sample which is going to incur some phase shift on this X-ray wave field, we'll see that as we move further away from that sample, that the beamlet will be further away from what we would see in black here if we either have no sample or if we're right up uh, at Z equals zero directly after the sample. So if we move to some distance downstream, Z equals delta, we can say, we'll see uh, that there is a transverse shift uh, in this uh, beamlet. If we look at a dark field case we can see similarly that as we move further away um, from the sample we see that the beamlet changes uh, and so we see an increase uh, in the width at z equals delta compared to the width that we see at z equals zero or if there was no sample present. So this kind of looks a bit like a, a probability function which is changing so we might say uh, that intensity could also uh, be described as a probability density function describing how likely it is that a photon is going to land at this particular position at z equals delta where we might place a detector. Um, and so we can replace intensity with probability density here and then we'd say that the dark field is simply increasing perhaps the standard deviation or the width um, of this probability density function. And in the case of the differential phase, we would say that the mean of this probability density function um, is changing as we move from z equals zero to z equals delta. So we can describe these kind of changes to a probability density function um, as a drift uh, for the phase change and as a diffusion uh, for the dark field. And I can use an equation to describe it quantitatively um, where we've got 
uh, the change in the probability function with time um, in either of these cases using uh, these two equations here. So a key thing about these two equations is that they both conserve energy or x-ray flux. So just like uh, the area under a probability density function should always be 1, uh, both of these equations will not change uh, the area underneath uh, this beamlet or the intensity. So unless there's uh, some attenuation present, we wouldn't expect that this intensity should change. So if we have both um, diffusion and drift of this probability density function, this can be described with an equation that's commonly known as the Fokker-Planck equation. And this is used in a range of fields, uh, which I won't go into detail of, simply to say that it has been widely used. Um, so we can adapt it for the x-ray form um, as shown here. So here, instead of talking about a probability density on the y-axis, we now talk about an intensity. And instead of changes uh, with time to this probability density function, we're talking about changes uh, with propagation distance z, so how far away, away from the sample we are. And we can describe, firstly, uh, how quickly this uh, probability density function is moving via the drift velocity d1 here in the conventional form. In the x-ray form, we're going to see that this drift velocity relates to the angle of refraction of the x-ray beam here. And so this angle here uh, is described by 1 on k, where k is the wave number, 2 pi on land of the wavelength, um, times by the spatial derivative of uh, the phase of this x-ray wave field here. So if we have a small angle, we would see that uh, the probability density function moves some small distance across. We have a large angle we see that it moves more quickly and so ends up further across at the same propagation distance z equals delta. The second coefficient that we see is this diffusion uh, velocity d2, so how quickly uh, the probability density function is spreading out. Uh, in the case here this is describing uh, the dark field um, which we can describe as d here. Um, and we express this as a function of z because the native behaviour of this equation will not give us the linear increase uh, in the width of the diffusion that we would expect, so we need to specify uh, some function of uh, z for this diffusion coefficient which describes the dark field signal. So those of you um, who are familiar with the transport intensity equation may notice that the first part of this Fokker-Planck equation for x-rays looks like the intensity, transport of intensity equation. So if we remove this diffusion term here and just look at the first part, that's exactly what it is. So this is used to describe how uh, intensity will um, change with propagation in the presence of some phase effects. So uh, to more intuitively understand this, we can expand uh, the brackets here and take a finite difference. So we see that this term um, expands out into these two terms. And we can describe the intensity um, gradient with propagation distance z as i z equals delta minus i at z equals zero divided by that delta. And then we can move that over to this side. So this is basically saying that the intensity that we would see at some distance delta downstream um, of the sample where we have the detector is going to be the same image that we'll see right after the sample at z equals zero with some extra kind of intensity um, variations that will depend on both the intensity of the wave field and the phase of the wave field. So these are not so easy to uh, understand uh, in their form as they are here. So let's look at an example sample. So if we have a sample that's a cylinder, we can say that the projected phase um, of the wave field that passes through this cylinder is going to relate to the thickness of the, the uh, cylinder. So it would look something like this. So we have either side of the cylinder uh, and then through the centre of the cylinder we have the largest shift in phase. If we take the derivative of that, we'll get uh, something of this form and the second derivative will look something like this. So if we then say, okay, let's uh, look at how these relate to the equation. This basically says that the difference between what we'd see immediately after the sample and downstream will be related to uh, the second derivative of the phase. So the second derivative of the phase goes kind of strongly bright and then dark at either edge. 
And indeed, that's what we see with propagation-based phase contrast imaging. The other term that we see here says that if we have some type of intensity variations, which we could perhaps introduce by using some kind of grating, so we see going from very low intensity to the very high intensity as we step out from behind a grating line. If we introduce this into our wave field, then place the sample in front, we're going to see that those uh, lines move around and they are going to reveal um, the phase gradient uh, directly. And we can see that the intensity here relates to the first derivative um, of the phase. So we can use this um, to understand where the contrast that we see comes from. Is it useful in experiments? Uh, yes, it definitely is. So the transport of intensity equation is the basis for the single image phase retrieval algorithm uh, published by David Paganen et al, which goes from some raw image with propagation-based phase contrast to a retrieved thickness image. So this is, provides a big signal-to-noise ratio boost, which we see here for a CT of a brain. It provides quantitative thickness um, of volume, so here tracking the amount of air in the lungs. Uh, it can also provide uh, CTs which are much more easily segmented where we see a different grey level um, for each material. It's also useful in speckle tracking phase contrast X-ray imaging and so we see that the transport of intensity equation has been used very recently by Konstantin Pavlov et al. Um, and where here we see an example of the, the CT uh, reconstructed using that approach. So we can think of the X-ray Fokker-Planck equation as basically the transport of intensity equation plus an extra term that can describe the dark field signal. We can look at it uh, in terms of uh, this beamlet, which is changing in the mean and width uh, to describe phase and dark field effects. And another way, which I won't have time to go into the detail of, is that we can get to the Fokker-Planck equation if we take a first principles approach but we say that the phase of the wave field is the sum of a component that varies slowly compared to the pixel size, so the phase effects, and a component that fluctuates many times over one detector pixel uh, and is therefore unresolved. And you can find further detail um, of this third uh, origin of the Fokker-Planck equation for X-rays uh, in the paper which has David Paganin as the first author. So how might this be useful? So the key thing is that this X-ray Fokker-Planck equation can simultaneously describe attenuation, phase and dark field effects. So this is useful in isolating those signals from each other, particularly near edges where we sometimes see some kind of cross-contamination. So here we've captured uh, an image using the single grid um, approach where we directly resolve uh, the grating pattern. Uh, we've got a gold um, grid pattern and some uh, perspex spheres. And so we can retrieve the differential phase images to get the projected phase image. And we can also look at how the intensity reduces to get something we call an attenuation image. But you might look at this image and say that these bright lines around the spheres are not attenuation. And you'd be correct, those are phase effects. And in fact, if we take this uh, phase distribution and numerically propagate it, 17 centimetres as used in the experiment, we see uh, that these phase effects are indeed coming directly from the phase and not the attenuation. So we couldn't divide through by those to remove uh, that effect. And you can see that really we're not getting an accurate representation of attenuation uh, with the kind of um, straightforward analysis. We also see problems from these bright fringes uh, when we're doing analysis. So here um, we've got uh, some more features and we see that at a large propagation distance, we have lots of problems near the edge in performing the analysis that looks at how far a grid pattern has been shifted. And that's due to uh, these bright fringes which get wider um, with larger propagation distance. The Fokker-Planck equation can also be useful in determining um, the regimes where features are or net are not directly resolved. So here we see the lungs breathing captured in both phase and dark field. Um, if we zoom right in on the edge of the lungs, we see uh, not just dark field, but we see that these features are really captured um, with phase, uh, whereas they appear when they're subpixel uh, as a dark field signal. It could be useful in determining how much of this dark signal is coming from edge effects, uh, and also looking at uh, what happens 
uh, in cases like where the light is focused. So if we have many beamlets being squeezed together, we see an increase in the mean, which looks somewhat like negative attenuation, but of course um, is not actually that effect, which is then further complicated if we place some kind of analyzer grating in front of that pattern. So how can we model these effects uh, using the Fokker-Planck equation? So we've looked initially at a single beamlet, um, a kind of Gaussian-like probability density function of the intensity. Uh, in any real system, we're going to have many of those beamlets um, through some kind of grating pattern. And we can describe that uh, using a sinusoid uh, of given uh, amplitude and mean, as well as period. So um, just as a justification for this, if we perform single grid imaging uh, and zoom right in on that grid pattern and take an intensity profile, we see something that does look indeed very much um, like a sinusoid. And if we have something like a speckle pattern for speckle tracking image where we directly resolve it, if we take that intensity profile, um, we're not going to see an exact sinusoid, but we will see something that can be represented, represented using a sinusoid um, as a basis function. Um, which you could get via some kind of Fourier decomposition. So let's have a look if we put this intensity in, first of all, at phase effects. So we'll look just at the phase part of the Fokker-Planck equation and place in uh, an intensity uh, that would be seen behind a grid or a grating. If we place this in uh, and we move around uh, the terms a little bit, as detailed in the paper as seen at the bottom here, we can get an expression for the grating pattern that we would see some distance downstream delta um, of the sample at the detector. And we can say how we would expect that there'll be changes uh, in the mean value, depending on phase gradients and the propagation distance and the wave number. Uh, we can see differences uh, that we would see in the shift of this grating pattern, depending on the, uh, the phase derivatives. Um, and so we can model different kinds of situations. So we can look at, for example, um, a linear phase shift, where we would just see that this, these beamlets move sideways. We can look at a quadratic kind of phase uh, signature from the sample, where we would see these squeezed together. Uh, and we can look at the edge um, of a phase feature, where we would see some kind of extra bright dark fringe. And so we can um, model this uh, by looking uh, at that equation for the case of an edge with some illumination going through some grating pattern and then through samples, a sample that contains two different materials. Um, and so this is contained in the supplementary material of the paper. And we see that uh, on top of this kind of sinusoid of the intensity behind the grating, we see this phase signature which disappears at propagation z equals zero uh, and increases with larger propagation. The bigger the difference in these two materials in terms of phase properties, the stronger that edge signal is. And if we have two identical materials, we of course have no edge as such and so no edge signature. If the properties are reversed, we see that that fringe kind of reverses in um, the bright dark side. If we increase the period um, of illumination, we can really isolate that edge effect and we see it occurring just within one part of the grating pattern. We have a much finer grating, we can see that this uh, edge effect is going to extend uh, over uh, several periods of the grating. We can do a similar thing for dark field effects, so look just at the dark field part of the Fokker-Planck equation, place in some kind of intensity seen behind the grating, and find a general form uh, for the intensity that would be seen downstream um, of the sample at the detector. And again, we have some general expressions uh, for the visibility, um, which will give us the dark field signal, uh, for the shift that would give the phase signal. Uh, and we can see that uh, here this dark field can give us changes um, in the shift, which should come just from the phase signal. So we can consider um, different cases again. Uh, quite an interesting one is to look at uh, two different regions of a sample where one is weakly scattering and the other is strongly scattering. And so we see that there's going to be um, a kind of a gradient between the two. If we look at the mean value, we can see that's going to depend on the second derivative um, of this uh, dark field coefficient. And so we can see that where this is greater than one, we're going to see that the mean increases where it's less than zero. Sorry, that should have been zero. We see that it decreases um, relative. And so again, we're seeing some kind of interesting edge effect 
And this also makes sense in a physical um, interpretation in that if we are near the edge of a strongly scattering region, that region is going to scatter into the shadow of the weakly scattering region that we see here. So there's additional scattered light here. But of course, the weakly scattering region does not scatter into uh, that region in the, the nearby shadow of the strongly scattering region, so we see less light there. And again, we can model these effects uh, with the expression. And so we see as we move to low propagation distance that the diffusive effect is less. And when we move to larger propagation distances, a stronger diffusion effect or dark field effect. If we have two materials that are the same, again, we don't see any difference or edge effects. And if we reverse um, the more strongly scattering region, we see this bright dark um, kind of signature near the edge reverses. Again, if we increase the, the period of illumination, we can see that edge signal um, quite isolated. Uh, and if we decrease the period of illumination, we see uh, a more and more significant dark field effect on that uh, illumination. And we can see that it can extend uh, this edge effect over several periods um, of the grating. So we don't have to directly resolve this pattern to be able to uh, see these effects. And so we can just as uh, easily apply these results to grating interferometry where we move a second grating across the illumination to analyze it uh, via a stepping um, curve. And so we can take the, the general expression that I had on these previous slides uh, and simply uh, convolve it with a sinusoid um, to get uh, these results. We can also do uh, apply this equation to the edge illumination, capturing images um, on either side of uh, the mask and in the center to isolate the phase and dark field uh, signals. And again, we can get the same general results uh, as shown on the previous slides. So there's many more possibilities um, for the Fokker-Planck equation. It can be applied to the inverse problem, so retrieving uh, the phase, the dark field, or the thickness of the sample um, from a raw image. It can be extended to two directions. Uh, this is the Kramers Moyle. Uh, equation where we uh, can go to higher order terms that describe, for example, a directional dark field where the dark field signal is different uh, in the x and y directions. We can incorporate uh, several dark field signals uh, using multiple diffusion terms. Um, so if you've got a particular shape of dark field, it could be applied to um, other types of phase contrast imaging that do not use some kind of grating or structured illumination. We can look at effects of imperfect imaging setups, boundary wave effects, and also apply uh, this to uh, imaging with other forms of light or particles. And these ideas are explored in the discussions of the two papers. Thank you to the organisers of XNPIG for the opportunity to present, and thank you for your attention. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions.